Assalamu alaikum and welcome to my number 26 of intuitive reactions, the MENA and Gulf regions. I say assalamu alaikum, Arabic for peace be unto you, because that is what Pope Francis uttered when he was in Iraq for his pilgrimage last week. He traveled to Iraq in peace and he went there as a guest of all Iraqis. During this three day visit, I couldn't help but notice the hubbub as the Pope traveled from one governorate to another, the intense security, but also the overflowing joy of Iraqi priests dancing in the streets. I saw white doves being released as a sign of peace and even a baby Pope with his mom behind the barricades. I also espied the way the Pope Francis was visibly moved by all that he saw across Iraq. Mind you, he was also showing his 84 years, not least with the limp due to the sciatica nerve that had seemingly flared up again. And I personally was also moved when the father of Alan Kurdi, a child who had drowned in the Mediterranean in September 2015 whilst escaping from Syria, met with the Pope. Or even when the pontiff sat in his Pope mobile and contemplated for a solitary moment a church that had been destroyed by ISIS in Mosul. But as I wrote in my opinion piece in the New Arab just before the Pope's Alitalia flight landed in Baghdad, the most determining moment for me was the visit by Pope Francis to Najaf and to the humble rented house of Grand Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani. This man is a marja'i, a reference, perhaps the highest reference for Shi'i Muslims, certainly in Iraq. The 45 minute meeting was a key to the whole visit. And the Pope described it only today during his public audience from the balcony overlooking St. Peter's Square as unforgettable. But so was Ayatollah Sistani's statement following the meeting in which he asserted that Christians are fully fledged citizens, not dhimmi, not protected members of Iraqi society, but citizens with rights and responsibilities. The statement also, by the way, reinforced for me his fatwa of 2014 to the same effect. And to highlight this visit, the prime minister's office in Baghdad stated that March 6th will now be dedicated as a national day of tolerance and coexistence in Iraq. But these observations, all of these observations will pretty much soon transmogrify into mere details lost in the fog of everyday realities. What I want to do now is to touch ever so briefly upon the present realities and future hopes of all Iraqis, Christians and non-Christians following this successful visit. I recall in 19, sorry, in 2014, when Islamic State overran and occupied Mosul, they claimed in one of their bravado statements, today Mosul, tomorrow Rome. Well, the best reply from Rome, from this Pope, is that he came to Mosul without any military divisions and proved how misguided this ISIS radicalism that wrought havoc across Iraq. So is there real hope? Who is responsible for moving the agenda forward? Is it the responsibility of the head of the Chaldean Catholic Church, the largest in Iraq, as well as that of the other ecumenical churches? Is it perchance the responsibility also of the Iraqi government to help promote dialogue. 
to discuss these questions that have been gurgling in my head for a couple of days, I have the genuine pleasure of welcoming anew Maya Jbaili, Deputy Director of Agence France Presse, who was in Baghdad during the visit and who covered with her colleagues the Pope's travels across the whole country. Maya, assalamu alaikum and welcome again to Intuitive Reactions, the MENA and Gulf regions. Now, thank you, Harry. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm going to stop. I did my bit. Now it's up to you to do your bit. You're in Iraq. You saw the situation better than I could describe it. So perhaps a few words on present realities and a few longer words, perhaps, on future hopes. Thank you so much for that excellent introduction. And thank you for having me back again. It's, it's, it's great to talk to you. And uh, I, I find it really, really astute that you pointed out the Islamic State's, uh, as you said, bravado statement back in 2014 and the way that the Pope managed to flip that on its head by coming himself to Mosul. And that really highlights a moment of hope and a moment that many Iraqis never thought were possible and particularly the Christian population. So I'll start by describing a little bit about what how, how the visit was received and then as, as you said, move into a little bit of the skepticism that I think we should be looking at the next phase with. During those three days, Iraq was captivated. Iraq, and I know the world was captivated, but Iraqis themselves were absolutely captivated and were glued to their television screens 24 seven to see what this man was all about. So many Iraqis had never had never met a Christian or didn't really know anyone who was, who was Christian. And they wanted to know what this, this man all dressed in white, this 84 year old man coming, coming from the Vatican, what he wanted to do in, in their country. For the Christians themselves, a lot of them who were attending the masses that, that, I, that I went to and the areas that our AFP correspondents spoke to them in, 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 in the North and other parts of the country, they really, they were almost in disbelief. I mean, they recalled moments of absolute terror post 2003 when there were sectarian militias that were running around the country and they, they didn't know if they'd be able to survive. And they recalled those dark days and they thought, in those times we never could have thought, and even just a few years ago when ISIS was still in the country, we never could have thought that the Pope would actually be able to step foot in our country. And here he is in front of us, just a few meters away holding a, holding a mass. So for them, there is cause for hope because there, was, there were dark times in which they never could have imagined that what was happening right in front of them could ever, could ever come to be, and it was. So that for them was, was, was enough of a spirit of hopefulness. And then obviously his words were beautiful. I mean, he touched on the history, on the culture, on the heritage of their country with such warmth and such familiarity that, that it really made them feel that he truly loves Iraq, that he loved Iraq even before stepping foot in it. So there was a very positive uh, papal glow, if you will, to the whole weekend. And many Iraqis were so happy just to escape from the difficult realities that they that they live in. There was a really interesting campaign in the days leading up to the Pope's visit where Iraqis were going on Facebook and Twitter, especially young Iraqis, and using the hashtag Itlub Nilbaba or Ask the Pope, they would make these they would make these, these, these demands of the Pope because they saw how local authorities in their hometowns were starting to pave the roads and fix the street lamps and put up new posters to welcome the Pope. And they were saying, well, the Pope should come every day. I mean, all these things that we've been asking for for, for years, the services should be improved. And now it's actually only happening. And they were saying, maybe the Pope can just wait a couple more months to come so that Iraqis, Iraqi authorities can keep, can keep fixing things. Um, but I think that's, it's, it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's humorous and it's funny, but it really captures captures what so many Iraqis have to have to come back to, which mm -hmm. is roads that are not paved, which is schools that have been left to left to ruin, which is hospitals that are that are still not not functioning. And that's why I think so many people were touched looking at the Pope's reaction himself when he was in Mosul and seeing the way that he was absorbing the destruction that was around him. And the reminder that we were constantly trying to make in our stories and, and, and when we were doing interviews is that the war did not end yesterday. The Pope is not coming to a place where conflict ended just a few months ago. 
there have been no guns firing in Mosul for, for almost four years. Mm. And there is still this level of destruction. Yeah. So I think, you know, after this, after this, again, this, this beautiful kind of papal positive uh, moment that we all live together and that we were so happy to live with Iraqis, we have to come back to the reality, which is that there are these long standing issues that despite all the goodwill shown by Iraqi authorities during the weekend is not going to be resolved by a single a single man, no matter how, no matter how uplifting and no matter how yes. positive his, his visit was, that these issues are, 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 are rooted in an unwillingness by Iraqi officials to overcome the corruption, overcome the divisions that they've always faced and actually get to work to serve the people that were you know, glued to their TV screens watching, watching the Pope all weekend. So that's, that's the issue that, that we're having is that there's, there's a, you know, there's a kind of, there's, the wake up now or the hangover, if you will, where you're waking up after this weekend and you're saying, oh, not a lot has changed, has it? Do you think, uh, Maya, in a couple of words, do you think that the visit, because I agree with you entirely, I have a large dose of skepticism about how this will impact the future of Iraq, but do you think the way it's worked out, do you think that it will enable the churches to be instruments of change? Will it encourage the government to try a little harder or are we going to go back into the same old, same old because sectarianism is there, corruption is there, oligarchy is there, uh, lack of government is there? I think one thing that we can certainly be hopeful about in a very narrow way is that the institutions of the Catholic Church had a moment where they were in unprecedented exposure to Iraqi authorities. Normally these institutions, these churches, even the priests at a single parish have very little interaction with authorities, have very little interaction with the public, Mm. even with the media when we would go for interviews. Um, Even my colleague was telling me earlier, she went to a church in Baghdad where, where the Pope held a mass. She was there in November to speak to some Christians and she went there today. And she was saying the difference is palpable. People are so much more, people are are vocal. People are willing to get in front of a camera and talk. Whereas before they didn't even want their first names to be mentioned. Um, So there is a, there, there is a, a, uh, an an openness and an engagement that, that didn't exist before. Now, what actually comes out of that engagement as a first step, I think that remains to be seen. I think we have to see how Iraqi authorities actually plan to to build on those personal relationships, those bilateral ties that have been formed, um, to increase Christian representation in parliament, to to increase, especially among Christians who are still in Baghdad, the feeling that they actually have authority that they can go to, their rights will be defended when they try to get expropriated homes back, that they will be heard, that they will be listened to. Um, And so there are some very real legal, logistical, bureaucratic challenges that they faced for years. And everyone is hoping, everyone is hoping that the exposure that has that has been granted during this visit will allow those 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 challenges to start to come apart a little bit. Three months ago, when we had our first YouTube uh, conversation, I asked you whether you were optimistic or pessimistic. And I must admit that you erred on the side of uh, pessimism. (laughs) Today, what does Mayaj Bailey think? Has the lever moved a little bit toward optimism or is it still where it is? Because you're a person who's seen a lot during your years as a journalist. Would you think that this is a moment to celebrate and then put it in a drawer? Or do you think that maybe, who knows, uh, to use a, a religious Christian metaphor, maybe the Holy Spirit has moved the people a bit? I think I, I really am impressed by the mileage that the Pope scored first when when he was here, because he went to areas that most officials would never dare touch down in, would never dare drive around in a golf cart in, including in Mosul where 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 he drove around and, and looked at the ruins in a yeah, golf cart. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it was it's that's incredibly moving and it was incredibly daring. And I think Iraqi officials appreciated that. And I think foreign officials were looking at that and saying maybe we can engage a little bit more deeply than than we have been. So I think there are some practical messages that were sent during the visit beyond the messages of, you know, just just hope, human fraternity, perseverance, Mm. etc. I think there are some very practical messages that that were also sent maybe a little bit less directly. 
and we can really build on that. Iraq can the, come in. The Pope uh, Maya, at the end, as he went into his flight back to Rome, he said to the a journalist traveling with him that Iraq would always be in his heart. And then he threw in another little unexpected surprise. He said, my next visit will be uh, to Lebanon. And I'm sure you will play an equal part if and when he comes to Lebanon. How do you do you react to that in a word or two, please? Do you react to that with, oh my God, one was enough for one lifetime? Or do you say, oh yes, uh, uh, more of it, please? I mean, I'm just hoping he'll be healthy enough to make it to Lebanon the next time around. <laughs> this marathon trip in, in Iraq was impressive enough. No, really, I think, I think it tells us a lot about who this man is. Hmm. It tells us a lot about what communities he wants to speak to and that he's so moved. I mean, it, it, it wouldn't be the first papal visit for Lebanon, yeah. but he would be coming at a time when Lebanese really need to hear a message of hope and Iraqis really needed at this time to hear a message of hope as well. And so it tells us where his focus is and what he's and who he's thinking about and what their struggles are that he wants to try to speak to. So I think it says a lot about about him and and yeah, uh, Maya, it was a pleasure. Truly, truly a pleasure. And I'm sure all the people who are going to uh, watch this YouTube episode will love it as well. Thank you for number two. In French, we say jamais 203, never two without the third. So prepare yourself for a third episode soon. <laughs> Take care. Thank you so much.